I call this meeting of the Deerfield Elementary School Committee to order at 6.06 p.m. And I want you to start off the meeting by acknowledging uh, the passing of Marty Barrett. Um, earlier this winter, she served many roles in our, our schools, um, most recently the superintendent, and she did a lot of good for the district, and she'll be missed. Okay, our first order of business is to uh, review and approve the minutes of January 19th. Um, there was one correction, um, and it was my misspeaking. It wasn't whoever took the notes. I I think I said ARPA money was the money being put in a capital reserve fund for the collaborative, but it was PPP money that was the big $4 million overage. So I felt like that was an important distinction to make given how much money um, we were talking about. So if we could correct just that one part of the minutes. You um, say it's not ARPA, but rather it's PPP loan. PPP money. Yes. Okay. Great. But I make a motion to approve the fact that that's correct. All right. Uh, do um, a roll call vote. <clears throat> Combination of in person and your note. Uh, Eric Jacob? Here. <laughs> I skipped over that. I, oh, oh, yes. I, I forgot what I was answering. Yes, I approve the minutes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Mary? Yes. Ken? Yes. Very yes. <coughs> Financial statement, Lawrence? I emailed you out the expense reports. Um, the only thing, and I didn't comment this on this in my email because you had sent that message already, but do you want to talk about the HVAC? Because uh, that will be an additional cost that wouldn't be in this report yet on the heat of an issue. Right. Um, I, don't I don't have the exact numbers, but yeah, I, don't I did send an email to you guys on Monday regarding um, the cold spike did cause um, us to have three different leaks in three different um, I don't know what they call them, condenser units in the building. Um, and um, they were been serviced and repaired, and then had to come back and be serviced again because one of them was formally again. Um, and at the same time, explanation of why it happened is that we have like three different systems that have been put in over the years, They're going back from even before uh, Velasco. And they put the heaters in apparently there's certain dampers that weren't shutting and this is the first major cold we've had um so then we also had to bring in siemens who's our um kind of the hvac electrical energy, you know, energy, energy management, management yeah. system thank you mm -hmm. um and we had to bring them in to reprogram it so that those dampers close when it gets that cold outside so it was a combination so we were fortunate that the water pump did not go on when it froze up it should have and was the time <coughs> um because we would have major flooding in those areas <clears throat> so, so that expense is not in this report yet obviously because we don't have the bill and the reports were only through january 31st so so it's around three thousand, i think yeah. mm -hmm. um if you have other questions about line items i'm happy to take them but there were no other major changes since the last meeting and uh, nine warrants were signed electronically, totaling $117,873.18. Great. Yeah. And thank you, Darius and Shelley, for keeping us apprised of the uh, HVAC problems during the cold snap. So, <clears throat> you know, I just had to say, you know, I imagine some people saying, well, who's monitoring the building, that kind of stuff. But Bill, you know, I did meet with Bill before the weekend and he um, met a plan to go through every single building to make sure he was on in all the buildings and you know everything looked and you know, appeared to be on um but wasn't and so he may have I don't, we don't know when it was during the day and just when we came in on when the things were getting chilly and then immediately they realized they had a problem so and he did go to all five buildings and make sure everything was and there was minor adjustments in each building to make sure things were running properly but we did not catch this one did you say something about a damper that wasn't programmed the right way? Or what? So, and I, again, I, I can have him um, write a note to you guys about exactly what happened, but there's different control systems that control the outside air and inside air, and they've been put in at different times with different systems. So um, it was originally programmed um, prior to the new boilers, I was told, Gosh. that was put in a few years ago. 
<laughs> all being done by different companies. So it was that kind of, um, they believe that school is the cost. And so he brought them in to fix that. And the other reason that we've never seen the problem before is we never had a cold spike like that. So at least in the last since the new boilers were put in, we believe that's what he believes. Again, I'm running off maybe third person information from Bill and who he talked to, but they believe it occurred when they put the new boilers, that was not set up. <clears throat> All right, no other comments on the financial statements? We can move on to the principal's report. Um, I shared a principal's report with you for your review. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Okay, next up is public comments. I know we have a couple of people in present and several remotely. Does anyone I'm planning on speaking a public comment? The moment, just in case people are trying to connect. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone speaking or raising a hand or whatever they can do here. Um, so we'll move on to um, unfinished business, the, this year 24 budget. <laughs> Um, so I did email out an updated report late today uh, after Darius, Tina, and I kind of regrouped and reviewed what we sent out um, yesterday and prepped for today. And so we added some additional items to that. I did print um, some paper copies. Can I pass that down? Can someone um, watch that? The majority of the information is the same. We just added some administrative recommendations. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna start by reviewing where we were at with the first meeting and the first budget draft, which was in January. We presented a 7.15% budget increase. It was uh, just shy of $365,000 increase over last year. Uh, there were several factors relating to that increase, one which being wages, which was um, just COLA and uh, steps for teachers and IAs, and then uh, increases for, for non-contractual staff. We also had a facilities adjustment of about 20,000 for some small facilities accounts that had been over budget in prior years. And uh, then we had to take into consideration revolving fund changes. Um, so our early childhood revolving account um, expenses are exceeding revenue uh, based on the current tuition and students um, who are residents, but they're paying tuition. I know we had a big discussion about um, what that preschool means on the report, uh, but we had to reduce uh, the early childhood revolving expenses by 52,000. We did the same for school choice because our school choice expenses are exceeding our revenue at this point. And then special education revolving, we had paid 60,000 for transportation. We no longer have a tuition and student into that program. Uh, so that expenditure needs to come off. So each of those factors correlated to the 7.15% increase. Uh, we also talked about uh, the request for two additional positions, a social worker uh, slash special education position or a behavior interventionist. And did I get those right this time? Do you know? They still have them wrong. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a, an, an additional $127,000 cost to add those two new requests in. So that put us well over 9% for the budget increase. We took those off. Uh, so we had a large discussion about what those numbers were compromised of or are made of um, and then decided to sit with it and then we would come back to you with next steps and, and second draft. Um, so there have been some changes since the January meeting. They're nothing related to any of the increases. They're natural things that have happened that have reduced our budget to 5.25% is what the second draft is at. That was due to a reduction in special education transportation expenditures based on actual transportation 
uh, routes for next year for our out of district placements. Um, our special education director came to me after that January meeting when she got more information and said, we're gonna have a reduction there. Um, and then additionally, we did have a, a personnel change. We had a staff member who was on an LOA um, submit a resignation that she's not returning next year. So that was a natural reduction in the budget. So we were able to take off you know, about 90,000 there. So that's great news uh, that we could come that far. Otherwise, we haven't really done anything else at this point to make reductions. Uh, we wanted to continue the conversation with you tonight as we prep for the March meeting. Um, so the next section is reduction considerations. And I'm gonna talk quickly about a couple of these, but then we really wanna get into the enrollment pieces because as administration, we feel like that's the point, uh, the piece where we can really make some change and bring our budget down uh, moving into next year and considering the future outlook based on the population of the school. Um, so if we wanted to go in with a 3% budget, which I know we haven't said that or established that, I just wanted to give you what that would look like dollar-wise, we would be looking at reducing about 115,000 from the existing budget. Um, as it currently stands at the 5.25. To get us to three, 115,000 would have to come off. Um, some options to reduce include the use of ESSER three funds. I talked about that at the last meeting, that we do have a significant amount of ESSER remaining. Um, so we could offset some wage costs and transportation costs. We could reduce the facilities lines that we increased by 20,000, although I don't recommend that. We really need that money. It's not we're not being frivolous. We're not adding new facilities needs. We're really just trying to cover the costs that we already have that have been in deficit for multiple years. Um, but it is an option if we're talking about crunching the numbers and trying to bring that down. So the last piece um, that we're going to get into a little bit further on the next couple pages are a reduction of staffing and programs. And this is never something that we really want to go to. This is usually last resort. Um, obviously, we we love the staff that we have, we need the staff that we have, uh, and we certainly don't want to cut anyone's position and, and have their personal life impacted. Um, but we are at a point where this decision really is enrollment driven, and it's a conversation that we feel strongly we need to be having as part of the budget discussion. Any questions before I keep going? Uh, I guess I just was, just to make sure I understand that there is pretty that there are three um, options, and one is to utilize ESSER three funds. Second is to, or is it a combination? I guess combination, I yeah. So, yeah, I just sort of threw some ideas out there for us to consider that um, if, we, if we absolutely were not in a position to reduce um, class sizes and staffing and programs, then we would have to go to ESSER. We don't have another choice. Our, our budget is um, level service right now, and we have a 5.25% increase. So um, we would have to consider those other options. And we didn't want to come in and just say, <clears throat> we need to cut. We wanted to give you everything that's on the table to consider. And the, the overall uh, goal of all of the, or the goal is to get down to the three percent is that your generally percent? you know our guide is around a three percent increase mm -hmm. um deerfield has come in above that i think i gave you that information um we've been under three percent for multiple years um slightly over mm -hmm. uh, in one particular year recently over the last couple if you look at the last page of that report eric i give you the historical information um so that's sort of our benchmark when we're building budgets and working on things and, and having that in mind of where we think we should be. That doesn't mean that you couldn't say come in at 2.5 or come in higher, but. Right, so your, your town can only grow its budget by two and a half percent. So when we are, the percentage that the schools make up and Deerfield is around 60-ish percent, if we are well over two and a half percent, we better be in discussion with the town because we're going to be taking from other departments and other shares from the town. So usually the, the rule is that you, know, you want to come in around two and a half. We're looking at trying to come in three, knowing that we see, see within that. If the committee within your, you know, within your power, you could say, 
we'll go to the town five percent and you can say as they as bill says put it up the flagpole and see if they salute um you can, you have that ability as in your authority um but you know those kind of conversations you're going to be at odds with the finance committee and select board what their priorities are in town so when, after we review this you know as you know, dealing, you know we do this in five different ways in five different towns and another time we have a huge budget problem um we actually have budget problems in three of our towns this year um and we can have start having conversations with those those entities the, the finance community select board if we can't find our own way out of this and then we're having that conversation in other towns where we're using esser money but if you use esser money you're only putting you're putting it down one year and you're gonna come back the following year with the problem plus because now you built another year onto that and so you're gonna have even greater um problems with your budget in the future so if we go through all this you can kind of get all the different options and then okay. it can be any combination thereof or you can say you can reject all of them and say um you know if you want something different let's come to a process here so we, our job to, is just to guide you, and you guys make the decision right. i just wanted to get a handle on exactly yeah. how much money we're talking about is it then that it is the 115,000 that we're trying to find that money or is there more than that that we are like what is it we absolutely you know what it what is the amount that we're talking about needing to use so, so there is that number of people. we don't have a number the town didn't give us a number and the town doesn't the town can guess at this point but they don't have the cherry sheets from the state yet because they're waiting in the governor's budget so they're kind of they know they have an idea where it's going to come in and they have an idea what they have for free cash and so on and so forth um so you know you know this is usually the range that we come in is between two and a half and three and a half is usually the the, the big range there so the hundred and fifteen thousand would be the minimum amount to get us to three percent if we want it to be around the three percent that's what i thought it meant i just wanted to make sure that that wasn't yeah. like just a portion of what no nope, that's, that's a great that's big... great clarifying point okay. um what i will say before we continue moving through this is that i think we talked about this a little bit um last month too is we're not talking about a one-year impact and i know ken did mention this that as we talk about our revolving funds exceeding revenues our expenses exceeding revenues there are going to be multiple years that we have to make this shift where expenses have to come off of other funding sources we're not eliminating them they just need to be paid from another pot of money so um you know i think where ken mentioned if it comes off of one fund it's going to have an impact on the general fund so while yeah. yes we're talking about 115,000 for the current year i recommend that we're thinking multi-year and that's part of what the presentation yeah, in, in enrollment. I think we have to get into the presentation because we start yeah. talking about yeah. what our and how that's going down and you can get an idea of all the different yeah. parts moving here. Good. Yeah. All right. So enrollment data. So this is based on October 1st. So some of this might look different if an enrollment report went out for February 1st. But um, as of October 1st, because that's what the state is going to use for Chapter 70 funding is the October 1st numbers. Um, our enrollment was 334, you can see 278 residents, 56 school choice. Um, based on uh, Tina's projections of what we're looking at for anticipated class sizes for next year, we're looking at 305, which is a significant reduction from the current year. Uh, we're, we're going down in our enrollment. A uh, big piece of it is, is K and pre-K. Those numbers are going to be a little bit smaller. And then we have a larger sixth grade class going out. Um, so when the large sixth grade class goes out, if we don't have a significant number of younger students coming in, we can't offset that loss. Um, so we gave you the uh, number of sections and then the, the size, class size per section here. Um, you can see that there are some existing classes that already do have 18, 19 students. Uh, and then there are some classes with um, three sections that have much smaller class sizes. Um, also, uh, looking at the pre-K numbers, uh, we have based on, um, I think Kim sent out most recent data to me today, that we do have six spots open in pre-K. I mean, yes, in pre-K, I'm sorry. Um, and then the kindergarten number of 32, that's based on the census. That's not actual students enrolled right now. So that number could actually be. As of today, we have 26 registered. So not including school choice. 
but no school choice on, on the census. We have 32 expected and we have 26 registered right now. Okay. Um, do you have a memory of how much compared to the census of how many, because who's going to choose private? <laughs> so typically, we come in right around the census, maybe four um, over that we get like movements. Is that what you're asking? Kind of like, you know, how close yeah. do you come to that census? We're, we're pretty, we usually come in pretty close to this number. Um, over the summer, we, we get a few more, no more than like four. So I think we're looking at like 36 top. If we don't um, add school choice, we've added a bit of, bit of school choice um, previously. Could I ask a question? <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, is <clears throat> since we were talking about the kindergarten program, I, you know, the projection for next year, the enroll, enrollment projection at this point in time is 32. You do have 26 already enrolled. Um, this year, you, I believe you're carrying 38 or 39 kids, uh, kids, uh, students <laughs> in the kindergarten program, and you have two sections. Is that correct? Correct. Um, how is that going? I guess would be my my question. Um, if you're looking at social versus academic, they're two different things. So I think that they're socially healthy classrooms, and they're you know they're they're doing really well with routines and um, you know we have actually have a kindergarten IA here. So please jump in and correct sure. me. Academically, I think that it's a little harder to get to every student to have those small group instructions and get that one-on-one -on -one right. teacher. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, that's, that's what I, I, I would be surprised if you didn't say that, but um, I, I'm trying to get a sense for if we continue the trend, because these are essentially the same numbers that we have this year with two sections. And has it been, I guess my question to you as an administration and as a faculty in the faculty input as well for our future meetings is, is it, a concern or is it a learning curve to figure out the academics or I mean obviously we'd like the small sections but um, I'm, I'm the question I'm asking is could we is it practical to consider two sections again next year for kindergarten which is part of your recommendation later on it's part of the recommendations later on. right so stick tight okay <laughs> And how many this year? 38 or 36? 30, 30. There's 38. And just FYI, there's nine, I believe, school choice. Right. In that. So I think that, that's going to come up with are we, are we doing school choice or are we not doing school choice? Keep going, Steph. All right. Um, so we can take the, uh, continue on here. I just was making a comment that we currently have more applications. Uh, for mm -hmm. pre-K that we have spots available. Um, that does happen. It happened this year as well. And we did have some families that um, went actually to some other programs within mm -hmm. our district. Um, so just wanted that to be out there. And then uh, I did give you information on the three grades that could potentially be reduced to two sections from three, um, kindergarten being one of them, uh, second grade, and fifth grade. Um, that would give roughly 19 students per class in each of those three grades. Um, you know, and one of the things that we've talked about, oh good, you're on that chart there. So you can see what the breakdown would be um, on that chart that is highlighted green and blue. And it is color coded because um, after our conversation, if we were to um, do this in multiple years, you know, and not reduce all three class grade levels, in the same year, we would say to do K in fifth grade um, in the current year, or FY24, and then reduce second grade in the following year, which would actually be the third grade class at that point, um, just if we wanted to pace this out a little bit farther. But if you look at the class sizes uh, based on this uh, change, um, we would have pretty consistent class sizes throughout the building outside of that one grade level, or throughout the building outside of that one grade level. 18, 19, 20 students per class. You know, and I, I just want to make the comment that this is not an easy thing for me personally to recommend. I, I know that we're talking about possibly 
um, actually eliminating some staff here. If there are no other resignations, if everyone returned from their leave of absence, um, if all of our you know brand new teachers were happy and, and stayed within district, um, this is not comfortable for me. I don't think it is for Darius or Tina either to come with these. And we we're not making any of these recommendations lightly. Um, there is a financial side of this that we have to be fiscally responsible, but we're also all human beings and want to take care of our staff. So just want to throw that out there that we're not making decisions flippantly or recommendations flippantly just because of the numbers. It's they're hard conversations and hard decisions to make. Um, so uh, do you want to go on to the next little section? Uh, I did put in a note here that um, the impact, I want you to understand the impact of the three teaching position. If we were to reduce those three grade levels to two sections each, um, it will not result based on what we're proposing in a direct budget reduction of three FTE salaries because we already have talked about our school choice and our early childhood expenses are exceeding revenues. So in order to plan for that for multiple years of bringing expenses off, we would recommend that we basically replace where one teacher is currently paid from school choice, moving that into one of the slots on general fund, just swapping out those numbers there. So there would be a reduction of um, two full-time salaries on the budget, even though we would be eliminating three positions. Um, and that is roughly, um, about a 2% reduction. So we would be talking about being at 5.25% versus uh, three, I'm sorry, we would reduce to 3.26% instead of 5.25 um, if we made those changes. Also within this, and Tina can jump in if you want, but we there is no instructional assistant reduction. So we're reducing classrooms, but keeping the same number of instructional assistants. So you have those larger classrooms, um, you have more support in those classrooms so that's another kind of it's not um sometimes when we reduce the classroom you reduce the instructional system with the teacher that's not the way it's it's how it's working in another school <laughs> that's not how it's working in this but <clears throat> it's not how it's working in us it's how it has worked in another school on the speak in the world <clears throat> shelly can you predict at all what if we were to reduce the number of sessions what that would long-term look like for school choice enrollment and decreased funding there yeah so that's something we've also talked about um and i did it i explained that i think um a little bit farther down if you want to keep going there Darius, skip over the future challenges um on the top of page five just, oh, just the narrative right. um so you're absolutely right that if our class sizes are smaller, it limits the opportunity to take additional school choice students because we don't want our classrooms to become too big um, with with only having two sections. So uh, what we're currently looking at, uh, we have 54 students with this year's claim of 335,000. Our projections for next year, um, I think Tina had 46 on this sheet. Um, but, you know, I think if we push that a little bit, maybe we get 50 students. So we're looking at a reduction of anywhere between 20,000 and 40,000 uh, next year. So our expenses would be exceeding our revenue by roughly 30,000 at that point. Um, so we would have to move that to another funding source, but that wouldn't happen until FY25. Uh, so for the current year, that one change that I'm recommending already of moving the teacher salary over, that would be the only change we make right now. And then we look at future years. Right. But you bring up a good point in future years, because if we look back at um, school choice, and you can see that when, and when the sixth grade leaves and then the fifth grade leaves, you're starting losing double, you know, right. well, the sixth grade is kind of an anomaly year, but the fifth grade and the fourth grade, we're going to place double digit numbers with single digit you know, and it's you know five thousand plus increment ahead per right. Right. So <clears throat> the thirty thousand deficit you just mentioned is that with current class sizes and that's numbers? considering that's um reduction? having 40 with the reductions if we were to reduce the class sections as we're proposing um and, and 
And does that also, yeah, does that also consider the um, changes in staffing? Um, yes. Okay. <clears throat> because that, as you say, you look at that fourth, this year's fourth grade class with 13 school choice students. Um, you know, we lose nine next year. We lose five the following year. And then we have this big 13 student bubble that's going to pass and uh, the populations will be decreased. Uh, but I, the reason I was asking about the staffing changes is you will have pulled out in your projections, would that include the pulling out of the ones, um, one position from school choice and putting it yes. over into the general fund? Okay. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we'll go down to the bottom of page four. Yep, that chart right there. Um, so this is a little synopsis. Uh, the middle column is before. So this would be where if we were not proposing any classroom size changes, um, what the numbers would look like. And then next year, you can see I reduced the revenue by 30,000 there, and then the 80,000 came off for the one teacher. So we're actually um, going to save a little bit of money next year. And then in FY25, you know, we would have to account for additional reductions in revenue and make some additional changes at that point. So this is a multi-year problem that we're facing. And exactly as Darius just explained, there's going to become a point where your school cho choice numbers are really small because you're not going to bring in, you know, 15 or 20 K students. You just aren't going to have capacity to do that. So, you know, in the year that we have four going out, we can replace four kids likely in the um, classes that we have, probably primarily in kindergarten. Um, but in the year that you have 13, there's no way we're going to bring in 13 kids. So we are going to see choice continue to go down, revenue continue to go down for multiple years. Those are the, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just wanted to clarify what this, what the numbers in that, in this are. Yep. They are, what is this, what do the, the totals here represent? Um, those are fund balances. Okay. So, so the start of the year projection is that one million thirteen thousand, our revenue, our expenses, and then end of year projection. And then if we were to reduce the class sizes, our revenue goes down because we won't be able to take as many choice students. But our expenses are also reducing because we'll move some of that money to general fund with one of the positions that we're cutting, um, leaving our balance still in a good spot. Um, so it's like the pot of money. Correct. And what's coming in. Yeah. So school choice okay. is really um, the elementary schools, quote unquote, for cash. You know, it, it allows us to have a buffer for any emergency projects. God forbid, knock on wood, the leak in the building, you know, the pipes bursting this weekend was $3,000, maybe $5,000 cost. That could have been astronomically expensive if we had had water damage throughout the building. Um, Right, where you have a student that enters that needs a one-to-one -one in the middle of the year, where you can get that money from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is our ability to put from there. And facilities things, <laughs> you know, we, we have a running list. We ask a little bit of the town for support every year, but, you know, the Freon keeps being an issue with the walk-in. When is that going to become a point where if that goes and we haven't requested as a capital expense, we might be having to find those funds elsewhere. So this sort of gives us that flexibility, whether it's student need or capital need. Um, and that's why we've maintained a significant balance in here, because this is our um, available funds for unforeseen expenditures. So if we don't move expenses off of this, you can really quickly see if you look out a few years, that 980,000, if you're overspending by 30 or 50 every year, it's going to go quickly. Um, you know, typically you want to keep uh, maybe one or two years of prior year revenue in arrears. We're over that. So we do have some flexibility, um, but you don't want to dwindle that down to say a hundred or 200,000. Like this is not going to save the general fund to use this money, which some people might be thinking that like, Oh, you have 900,000, just offset your budget with that. It's not, that doesn't solve the financial problem. Um, okay, what what didn't I talk about? What else do we need to talk about? 
I don't think we need to go through all the charts. I really was just trying to give you guys some information. So on, they are, they're really they're pretty. pretty. <laughs> um, it just painted a good picture so you could see where revenue and expenses are. Uh, I did not address um, much in this report or even talk about really that early childhood is, the sa is having the same problem. Um, I think we could uh, slowly tackle that as well. I think we could use ESSER funds to help support uh, some of the <coughs> excuse me, expenses in early childhood over the next two fiscal years. Um, expenses in there include IAs. So, you know, if we have to pull an IA off, it's uh, less impactful than a full teacher salary as far as a budget number. You know, you're talking 25, 30,000 versus 60 or 80,000. So if we had to throw that on general fund for a couple of years, I think we could manage that, um, which is why I didn't get into as much detail. But with school choice, you know, if the majority of our three or 400,000 of expenses is wages, a lot for us to tackle versus early childhood is, you know, we probably have to cut 50,000 off, not hundreds of thousands. So. <clears throat> Well, it's a lot to consider, and I know I've I've talked a lot. So, um, throw your questions or comments at us. I have two comments that aren't necessarily like measurable, um, and I don't know how we get input from teachers or administration on this, but it feels like this decision is like really cementing several years of what the climate and culture of the school are going to look like and sort of closing the doors to more school choice. Um, and also, I, I think I mentioned this at our last meeting, but we've, since I've come in May, we've talked about the impacts of the pandemics on, on the kids and where they're at, and there's a whole lot of work ahead. And I guess, I know we have to make hard decisions, but I, I don't wanna lose sight of where the kids are at and what support they need. And it, it just doesn't feel like the best time to be sort of like cutting positions of any kind in the school. I recognize we're in a hole and I just, I don't know what we can do to prevent that or kick the can down the road. And I know that's not like the long-term solution, but it, we're also in this very important moment in time where we're recovering from a pandemic and supporting academic learning as well as social learning is so important as well as like this impact of school choice and closing the door and just having basically two classrooms moving forward. Like that seems like a pretty big decision for us to be making that could impact the next six to 10 years of what our school looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't feel like I have, like I have the numbers, but I don't have the like cultural input and the, the sort of like comments from teachers and like what that means to like be able to say yes, cut the positions or like, hey, can we kick the can down the road? If that makes sense. Um, so last year, we administration came and we really wanted so these class sizes have not changed by that much. And we really said we need to keep it was not the year to start reducing the class sizes. So we did kind of we did kick that can year. once last year. Okay. Um, that puts us to this year. Um, you're absolutely correct, the trickle effect that this will have on the larger district as well, because Deerfield is the biggest feeder of school choice to Frontier. And so that now you're, we are already projecting ahead that the middle school is going to get smaller at Frontier, and then the high school will get smaller at Frontier. And things might offset over the years, we might get a population boom, you never know, where could go yet, those kind of things. But we are looking ahead that when your biggest feeder also starts, is, is getting to shrinking. Um, you know, they're going to have instead of class sizes of around 100 at Frontier, you know, we're projecting four years out to around 70. And so the number of sections, the number of offerings, the number of, you know, that all is going to have a trickle effect. Um, well, that impacts the quality of the education that our kids are going to be having up and through. When you get, yeah, we, I mean, when you get a certain size, and that's why I've always been a proponent of keeping, you know, <laughs> You know, there's complaints about frontier and the amount of school choice, but the, the, the size <laughs> buys you having on a program. And when you lose programming, then you also lose people because then folks right. who have an option, who have the ability to go to a different school to seek out whatever programming they want. Yeah. We've seen that happen when we've done these kind of reductions, um, reductions in services in our elementaries before. 
not my tenure, but before my tenure that happened and people left. So we're not reducing services here, so I don't think there's gonna be an exodus on that kind of thing. Um, but you're right, it is a culture thing that well, potential <clears throat> to be paying out like later, right? So we're looking at like this year and this moment and like the next two to three or four years, like the impacts sort of on the, the right. other end could be costly too. Right. And it's hard to predict that. So I, I agree, you can't the, measure and predict. Going back to the numbers, the problem is that your group's gotten smaller with its residents mm -hmm. coming to school here, you know, so we're going to school here. Um, so, I mean, so our population's gone down so that being able to, you know, it really would be a full section of school trips, you know, and unless you have, you know, the major spread increments, it doesn't pay for itself so, in most so, cases. Yeah. And to your point, if we do flex classrooms, there is no wiggle room for school choice, <clears throat> right? right? There's no wiggle room. And the numbers are precarious a little bit because if we have some move-ins, you know, 18 is, I would say, you guys can pipe in, 18 is like a doable class size, especially if we're keeping all of our instructional assistants in. Um, our goal is to ensure that there's at least an instructional assistant in every classroom looking preliminary at the numbers. If we collapse um, all of these, we can do that. Um, I think my philosophy, your philosophy is correct me if I'm wrong, is to keep them smaller in the younger grades, collapsing fourth grade, I, I don't, into fifth grade, I, I don't see a potential, um, I don't see a, a huge negative impact to that. I do mm -hmm. see that increasing some of their social healthiness in that class size by fourth grade. <clears throat> That's what I would say there. In kindergarten, we're looking at 16 um, in each class size. <clears throat> it's just, are we out of school choice or are we not? That's where it gets a little bit trickier, I guess. Mm -hmm. But kindergarten having a class size of 16, I don't think is um, unreasonable. We just shut the door on school choice. Then. But then At you have point. to shut the door on school choice. So that's when we were talking about it. I'm like, whoa, what impact does that have? <laughs> Huge, right? right. So, I mean, from right. my perspective, in terms of. Yeah. Input. I was just going to say, like, um, it, I'm also kind of curious. I was trying to do a little bit of looking to see like what trends are in terms. I mean, I've heard that the you know that our our population in Deerfield is going down, but and um, you know the demographics are shifting. But I was um, kind of curious about that, even even stretching that out a, a little longer to see like you know because I can look at these numbers and yeah, there's the there's a lower number of. Uh, I guess I was just wondering because you know if you look at school choice in these numbers alone, it is actually increasing as they're getting younger. Like it goes from four to seven to eight after it had dipped, dipped down. And I was just sort of wondering like what um, what are the trends you know, in general of like are can is there a way to predict i mean i guess <laughs> is there of course nobody doesn't you know it's like you need a big snowstorm and then you get a huge birth of kids but um you know in terms of like sorry. <laughs> um but you know just in terms of like do we perceive that this is a trend that is you know that it's going that there are so if down. you go to um page two of that report mm -hmm. at the top the enrollment data you can see the school choice number from 2019 to 2022. Okay. And we've gone from 67 to 46, which 46 makes sense because 2020 right was, mm -hmm. you know, COVID impact. We bounced back up to 54, 56, um, but we are expecting to see that drop down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not sure we would hit 56 even if we kept the class sizes as mm -hmm. they are. Um, the sixth grade number, I don't have the breakdown in front of me. What's the current sixth grade? Nine. Nine. Nine, <laughs> Nine is a lot to replace mm -hmm. in one year, as is, you know, the, the class that has 13 and 10. It, it's hard to get that many. And I'm also students. just, oh, sorry, I was just going to say yeah. also that the numbers from uh, you know, obviously there's a big dip from 19 to 20 for residents, but they are sort of, you know, in a lesser way kind of climbing up a, a little bit. 
Yep. Again, whether that's something that's continue, you know, if that's a trend that's continuing or it's going to level off. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to get into the weeds. I just wanted to sort of understand all the factors at play. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that there's a simple yeah. trend with school choice that bounces. Yeah. No. There's also, we've been, <laughs> we haven't shrunk as a school because of school choice. So, right. you know, our right. indicators probably, um, if we accepted no school choice, you know, we would have shrunk. <laughs> Along with the refs of the county that's shrinking, you know, through steady. And that kind of not just here, that goes up to frontier as well. Um, so, will it pop back up? It could. You know, if we see a pre K enrollments go through the roof next year and, you know, um, you know, that kind of thing, then you, you would have to be back to the table going with the attitude. Right? And then, yeah. You know, that kind of thing. And, and as Tina will tell you, it's not great having. Three, two, three, yeah. two. It causes right. a lot of disruption within the staffing because you've got to, every yeah. year someone's going to be like, "Oh, you're yeah. going to teach a different grade," that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I'm sure they also we've got a smaller class. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I can't see their faces, so. But yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but if, if you know we get an increase in enrollment, we'll have to adjust as well. I guess that's one. I mean, I don't know if it's time yet to talk about some of the details, but um, like the fifth grade class size, I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, as I was starting to try to look at, okay, this <laughs> next year, this fifth grade will be the sixth grade and fourth grade, you know, that does, it's in that same way of like doing the adjustments up and down, like why would you want to you know, and I'm saying this just as a curiosity question. Why would you, why would it be a good idea to go from a fourth grade that's really full and then a three, it's a full three class, you know, that I'm looking at what it is right here, 2023 to four. It's a full fourth grade and then having it reduced down to a two, two classes for mm -hmm. fifth grade and then back up to a sixth grade that's full. Like um, at least the numbers, unless I'm looking at this wrong, but You've got 55, then mm -hmm. down to 40, and then 55. If you reduce that fifth grade class to two classrooms, does that not then mean that you have to come back after the fourth graders become fifth graders and add a class? Mm -hmm. Well, the sixth grade class has three, and that's not going to change. So someone would have to shift so down that's the to fifth grade, grade. <laughs> um, which you we have more shifting right now than we would have, you know, if if everybody was at two. You would it's have three, three, three now, though, right? Is that what I'm looking no. at? No, no, it's not. We have it's two in kindergarten, three in first grade, two in second grade. But fourth, but in that fourth, 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 I mean, general. I don't know yes. staffing. Yeah, and yeah. It, just, make it. And so, and then there'd be only two sections in sixth grade. Well, no, I guess I was saying if you keep it at, at yes, it would still mean a two, but the thing is that at the moment it's three. So, why not keep the three for those three grades as just so that there isn't dropping down? Um, the, the kids wouldn't know the difference because they're in the same classes. Right, so if you have, I think the, the, that once mm -hmm. that fifth grade will forever be a two section fifth grade, and it's full time for another year. Mm -hmm. okay. You would intend to go the next to the third year, then split them into split 40 by three mm -hmm. because that would, right? Right, yeah. just, <coughs> sorry, I'm getting it, it's, it's getting confused because at the moment they are 40 split into three, yep. so to keep them, but we're doing that to reduce. Stopping. No, I understand. That. Okay, okay. I just, I just <laughs> perhaps you so, can tell us try to not reduce staffing, okay. but I'm yeah. trying to see if you know. If I if I may, um, it, you know, this is this is a difficult conversation we've been having for going on probably five or six years now. Um, 
I think even before Darius started as superintendent, we were wrestling with the enrollment question, the reliance on school choice to fund so many positions in the school, and the looming decline in population, not just in our own community, but throughout this area of Western Massachusetts. I mean, if you look at virtually every school in Western Mass, and correct me if I'm wrong, Darius, uh, or particularly in Franklin County and Northern Hampshire County, uh, enrollments have declined and are continuing to decline. And the outlook isn't great right now. Back when we built the school you're sitting in, we were looking at uh, plans that called for an additional wing planning on this school for the expected population increase. And then we've gone in the exact opposite direction. Uh, we built a parking lot out, out front of the school that was half the size it is now because okay. we didn't have the employees we have now. Uh, the various programs and special needs uh, that have come up over the last 15 years or, you know, or 20 years have really added costs. Um, but we're, we're faced right now with a continued decline in, in enrollment that's putting us in this difficult position. I certainly don't want to, you know, I, I would love to avoid staffing changes, um, but I have also been through enough town meetings and and been around town long enough to know that the reaction of our citizens and the town meeting is that when you and we're not there now but when you were when we were approaching 20 to 30 percent of the total student population coming from outside the community of Deerfield um, there was a lot of pushback and maybe that's why I'm as sensitive as I am to this whole issue um, School choice has done tremendous good for the Deerfield Elementary School and for the Frontier Regional School District and the Union 38 schools, um, but it's a double-edged sword. Uh, we can't, I can't um, picture a pleasant town meeting if you come in and aren't reacting in some way to reductions in um, enrollment. Uh, by looking at staffing, uh, because the townspeople don't want to see us have three classroom sections for, you know, 40, 40 students through all six grades. Um, and I understand the impact that this has on faculty morale, on culture, on the community. Uh, when you're you're moving from you know, two teachers in one grade and to three in another and the need to shift teachers around. I, I don't, it's, it's a tremendously difficult um, decision that we, we have before us. I think Shelly, Darius, Tina, and all of the administration have put together a very um, good summary here of what the options are to try and get down to the two and a half to three and a half percent. Um, and I think we can find a balance in here of staffing changes, ESSER funds, you know, using revolving funds, uh, school choice, et cetera, to try and balance things off. But we still end up in the same place that as the enrollments continue to stay down, and our school choice numbers continue to erode, all of the money that we've been spending out of school choice has got to be transitioned back over to the general fund budget. Um, and that's a tough, tough road to hoe. And I think, you know, Shelley has given us some, uh, you know, a, a rudimentary map to, to uh, help us make decisions, but, somewhere we've got to make changes. It's not that we've been kicking the can down the road. We've been recognizing and trying to make changes over the last three or four or five years. Um, but we're now getting closer and closer to the point in time that 
the hard decisions will have to be made. So um, I rambled on too long. <laughs> Oh, and one last thing, I'm sorry. Um, it's true that if we reduce three positions, for instance, in the general fund budget, uh, we will have to shift something out of uh, school choice into the general fund budget. We wouldn't get the full reduction in the school's budget of, of three staff re position reductions. But a portion of our benefits, mainly the insurance costs, um, health insurance costs for our teachers is carried by the town, uh, not by the schools. And that would be a reduction to the town budget that uh, should also be considered uh, or, you know, taken into consideration as we have the discussions. So um, anyways, I've, I've rambled on long enough, sorry. <clears throat> Lori, I saw you raised your hand. I'm just going to ask you to um, sit tight while we finish our conversation. So, <laughs> you yeah. through everything you were going to I did. I'm through everything, unless I missed something. So, I'll tell you where you are at in your current setup of process. Your next meeting is the public hearing. And so, um, you have to either you have to have a number to go forward to public hearing. Your town meeting is. Um, I'm just going to give you the map of your what you actually you have to do. Tonight, but give you an idea. Um, I don't have to count here. So um, public hearing is currently set for the 9th of March, and town meeting is currently the 24th of April. We would have to give the town probably the budget. Um, you're gonna have to give them an indicator of where they're at by the beginning of April. Um, I mean, if you're fighting over small amounts, I mean, that'll be fine, but they will get Frontier's budget on the by the 11th of March. Um, so two days after your, um, your public hearing on the budget, because the, the Frontier budget, as we all know, is, does also affect we have to play together with the frontier budget. We don't know the assessments for frontier because we're waiting for that from the state. When do but, they have to publish the warrant? And does it does the published warrant have the budget numbers in it, or do they still have time to work on it? They have to publish the warrant two weeks prior. Two weeks prior, okay. and it usually has the final budget numbers or the final you're proposed allowed, budget numbers. You're allowed to reduce on town floor. I don't think you can increase it. <laughs> That's correct. Once it, once it's published, you can go down. You can't go up. <clears throat> so, you know, some of um, you know. So anyway, that's your timeline. You you are welcome to um, when you have your public hearing on the budget. Doesn't mean you have to vote the budget. Okay, that's what you are you're proposing that you know that you want to get feedback on. You really shouldn't increase it after the public hearing. I'm not sure if it's a law. Do you know if it's a law or not, Mary? No, I don't think it's or it's just not good practice. No, it's not a lot. <laughs> good practice to vote it, listen to the public comment, and then just go ahead and vote without, you know, time right. to consider their input. Um, but you want to give them an indicator at your public hearing about what you're doing. Right. Um, right. Yes. So I just want everybody to kind of know what the where you're at right now. So, so I'm wondering, you can't, I mean, you can't factor in, you alluded to school choice, what that adds to the culture, because I've always heard that over the years, that, you know, our, our school choice students and families have always added a lot, um, particularly since we right. have yeah. such a decrease in population. But one thing that we could talk about is what, what do we feel as a committee is your ideal class size. What are, what are we looking for? How big or small? Is it different for the younger kids or the older kids? What class size are we aspiring mm -hmm. to? Yeah, I was gonna. I was just sort of gonna ask too. You know, when we talk about the potential 
Shane, you know, you have a paragraph in here about talking about how the the the, the decisions will have a change to the culture, future trajectory, etc. Um, and you know that, uh, and and so in in that same sort of vein, like really kind of wanting to know what is your what's your vision for this cult that culture? What do you what do you want? That ideally would be the way forward. Um, I don't want to take away from your question, Mary, but I think you might be able to find right. Same along the same lines. Mm -hmm. um, What's that? Yeah, so what is, what is, that your, idea? Idea? <laughs> yeah, what so is your ideal? You had, said, you had said something yeah. in one of our meetings that pre COVID, the class sizes were not as small as some of our class sizes now. That is absolutely true. That pre COVID, we never had class sizes of 14. Please, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Um, they're right, like we've never seen these sizes. And I think that, um, you know, the last few years we've had that size, and we've seen what we can do with classes that are that size. Um, to your point, you know, like how is it impacting our students? We have one grade level that, you know, I still see that we're. Ex and in particular, that I still see that we're experiencing COVID. That is not a great level work we were even moving on touching. Um, me personally, I, I you know, I think that a class size from four to six of eighteen is not a, a, a large class. <laughs> when I first came here, I think our class sizes were around eighteen and nineteen. We have one class that was around twenty-one. Now we're factoring into the COVID stuff and when are we going to kind of get over that i think the 20 in kindergarten is a little bit much i think the 16 is a pretty good number for kindergarten 16 to 18 i think you're pushing the high end and that is i just want to throw out there with an instructional assistant in the classroom as well like i think that if you're going to increase class sizes we've i will argue that we're relatively thin on ias i think mary would argue even um, louder that we are relatively thin on IAs. I think we do a, um, they are fabulous, and I think we do a super job with a few of them. <laughs> so something Mary just, and maybe I'm misinterpreting what she's saying, but like, is it possible that it makes sense to have, you know, three sections up to second grade and then drop down to two? Or is that just sort of asking for, so you're not necessarily flip flopping per class all the way through? But in the younger grades, like there's guaranteed smaller class sizes, and then as they get older, and it's better for a variety of reasons that it's you know it's two from second grade or third grade on, or is that also kind of logistically too challenging? I think that it depends on the makeup of the classes as well, and how many kids are in there, and we can't really account for who's going to move in, who's not going to move in, and so at some point you might get to a like, oh no, now we need to have 21 in a class because we're trying to, to consolidate. We can't, they're moving targets, the numbers are for the kids with, with enrollments, they really are. Like we have some that move in and some that move out. Um, if we could predict it like that, I think we probably would have because doing like the three, two, three, three, two, two, right. it's not Which fun either. That yeah. 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 Well, I hear what you're saying, I and mean, it, it, it does make sense for. Some larger classes, mm -hmm. big grades. If you look at next year's third grade class of 29, as they go through, you know, I'm right. to ever you need three sections. Right. So there's always going to be some shuffling around. Right. And let's say, so let's say worst case scenario goes and we predict our numbers all wrong. So let's look at the K number. And right now we said it's at 32. Tina said, oh, we could have you know four <laughs> more than that. And so now that puts us at 36. And then let's say she's way off and we get, we get, you know, 42. Well then, you know, that's gonna, you know, we would have to make, we'd have to adjust, come back here and say, we're gonna have to use school choice money. We didn't mm -hmm. offer mm -hmm. it and this is gonna be a larger cost than, we, than, you know, than we can handle. I think just knowing that you, we do have the ability to adjust and just like, you know, you, we save money here, we could have, um, we have a student with high needs come to the district and, you know, you can you, know, you can have one particular, one student with some level high levels of disability where it could be a hundred thousand dollar bill, and it, it could change your all your you know everything that you've done that kind of thing. So I think we're constantly while we have to make decisions, they're not 
they're in stone for that budget, but they're not in stone for the school in the sense of like, oh, you know, you're just going to have to have 24 <laughs> classrooms in kindergarten. Um, you know, that's you know, that's something that. And the kindergarten number is always one that comes up. So if we're going to collapse and have two kindergarten classrooms, we're not going to have school choice. If you want three kindergarten classrooms and smaller numbers, then we're going to have to have school choice, and you'd have about 10, nine or 10. So that's a number. But that once you let school choice in, you, they get to stay. So right, and then they stay throughout. Right. So mm -hmm. then you're not going to, yeah, when you go up, you're not going to shift back. So, yeah. And one of the things that's confusing, but it's hard to really um, grasp the impact of school choice in that it seems like it does, but like you said, it's, there are pros and cons, you wrote in here, Shelly, um, that it, on the one hand, um, it it it's increase it, it seems like there's an imbalance in the amount of um uh, the way it um the expenses and the and the income don't quite match mm -hmm. i guess it's maybe the best way to say it. it seems like you there's less money coming in than is spent or is it is it correlated that way? I'm not sure. Like, mm -hmm. I, I guess when you were saying, you know, because I was looking at it, it's like, okay, well, um, you know, as I looked at the numbers and you, you were doing the comparison between, where are they? Where before the class size, or maybe this is maybe this is not the factor that I'm thinking it is, but before class size position re, uh, or reduction, you, we were spending more than, you know, the expenses are way out, you know, it's like seven, 70,000 or so and then it's less after after the uh, uh, class size is reduced um like we we end up with a bigger number left in reserve so well, that's that because we moved with this assumption in that chart it's moving one teacher off of school choice onto budget in exchange for that money that we're freeing up from one of the positions being eliminated okay, so, so if we had to keep that position in here mm -hmm. we would be um, at the nine nine thirty four okay and it, then but and you brought up a good question yeah. and Annie had actually had asked me that offline the same question is what's the cost of a school choice student and you know compared on what the money we we get on that and that's an impossible number because each student is individually is different so, and I use the example, if a student, school choice student is in Tina's office every day um, and, you know, and also, you know, needs additional support, there's no billable unless the student's a special needs student. And even if he's in Tina's office, Tina's billable uh -huh. hours isn't, isn't applied at all there. So, and that goes across the board. The only thing that we're able to add um, to the bill of that student is services by the PA. Mm -hmm. So all the other things that they they bring in, and they bring positives to the classroom too, you know, um, you know, even on the positive side of it, a school choice student who's advanced and the teacher has to do extension lessons in order to meet the child's needs, there's no way of you know recognizing, you know, uh, putting that within the budget. Um, you know, so and then the school choice kid the best friend of your child. There's no way to put a number on that either. You know what I mean? Like, I think the emotional side of it, I want to kind of put the whole thing out there, right? You know, it brings it brings diversity to your classroom, you know, that kind of thing. But but so it is kind of hard when people the idea really is that if you had, you know, 14 students in the class and you added four more, it really should be the same class around the class, but it's not. Not always that way. But I do think it's a really important clarification that you make because I think sometimes, and we can talk about town meeting in a variety of ways, but I think there's not an understanding that like school choice does offset our budget. And like if someone requires real specialty services, it's not just our district giving it away for free. You know, I think that sometimes that gets lost in translation. So I think it's important to say that again here in a public platform and then also at a town meeting when that is shared that um, it is a double-edged sword yes. but it's also if someone requires specialty services we're not just giving it out the other district is helping to offset those costs but the town's also paying for kids that go out of district as well so we'll argue that they don't think we should have school choice not only is it the kids coming in here that we're paying for it's also the kids who choose to go out the town has to pay that bill right we don't see the impact of that because it doesn't hit our budget, but the town sees the impact of it. 
And and the perception is out there that, you know, if we've got a $16,500 cost per student on average in the budget, I'm just taking a number off the top of my head, but we're only getting 5,000 for a student that comes in from out of town. You know, we're, we're losing the, the perception in the public, the general public, to go to Annie's point is that we're losing money on the deal. Um, what's not understood is that the school choice program has paid for, initially paid for a tremendous amount of resources in the school that a lot of area schools weren't able to afford computers and electronics and, and moving into the information age all took place because we had school choice funding that helped us with that. Over time, we had to shift from investing in resources of, of either a physical nature or programs or, or things like that. We had to start investing in the more important human resources that are necessary to to manage a school in this day and age. Um, and school choice helps us with that and continues to help us with that. <clears throat> um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's really, it's, it's just, it's, it's a tough one to ref wrestle with. And we've, you know, I think what we need to do tonight is give our administrative team a sense as to what, where you want to end up in terms of um, an overall increase or, you know, the proposed budget increase and how you want to get a, go about getting to that stage. If you want to go in at five and a quarter percent where it sits now, you can, you can try doing that. Or, you know, I, we should make a decision and uh, try and come to a consensus for them so that they have a little more direction this time around going into our, our next meeting. Um, this is not, you know, as, as Shelly and Darius have both said, and Tina and everyone I think in this in the room and at this table, at the table there, um, this is not a decision anyone wants to make or has, you know, wants to make. Um, and I hate budgeting time of year because it always comes down to talking about percentages and dollars. And what we're dealing with <laughs> is the education of our children in the community and the dedication and, you know, well, you know, the dedication and professionalism of the people on our staff and faculty. That, that support the education of the kids. Um, and, you know, there's no easy way to, to do it. So, anyways. I apologize. Well, thanks, Nels. At the um, March 9th hearing, in theory, so we'll present one of these, or we'll, we'll give an idea of what direction we're headed in, maybe by the end of tonight. Um, and at that point, we may hear from like teachers and so basically, other stakeholders. Yeah, and then, a, public, a public hearing basically is that it is a open to the public to discuss the budget. Gotcha. And we will invite the select board and the finance committee to come, and they usually send a member or two. Okay. Um, and they will talk about how that those numbers are going to affect their budget. And at that time, they will, they will have the state's number, so they will kind of give their kind of feedback there. Um, that's usually, yeah, like ninety nine percent of the time, it's just other government bodies. But anybody can come in, and then we close the public hearing, and then we have a school committee meeting. And so, and then at that time, sometimes as you know, we have voted the budget at that public mm -hmm. hearing. After, right after the public hearing, and as Mary kind of said, sometimes it's a bad taste in people's mouth because yeah. you didn't really listen, um, or you didn't show that you were going to listen because you you scheduled a vote immediately following. Um, and that sometimes it doesn't matter when they, if we're coming in at two and a half and not cutting anything and everybody's happy, yeah, we're gonna vote right after if there's nothing. This particular one, we probably were gonna want to do another date where we're gonna, we're gonna actually vote the budget and have to put another uh, meeting on the calendar. And, you know, meeting on the calendar would be, Again, with just this being the agenda item, that kind of thing. Um, but I'm just kind of giving you the overview that 
the hearing looks like. It's, yeah, because you are you. This is your no, first. Right. Budget, this is your first budget cycle. And we haven't. And we've been fortunate that we didn't have. We haven't had controversial budgets recently. So at least we do have. So you know, the public hearing, you don't have people coming and um, you know, pulling you one way or another with that kind of stuff. Right, different ideas and such. But once we go into yeah. that, it's not likely we would go up. You Correct. shouldn't. So you like, shouldn't. And we were just kind of saying it, it would be you. You increase it afterwards. You should come in higher, and if you're going to reduce, you know. So. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be out of the question to come in at five or less, based on maybe some of these other things we could knock off to have that sort of more public input, and then make the decision. Like that would be versus going in at like trying to get it as low and. As possible, straight out the gate without. Well, and you do. You guys also have a another curveball with this is that you do have escrow money, right? So you can you can you could do a combination um, where you can backfill with escrow money, and not to make this more complicated, and I probably am going to show you can just kick me. But you could technically Come and say first what you're going to say. <laughs> And then and mute your mute your mics. What I'm trying to say is that you have the answer, you have enough extra money where you could say that we are going to reduce two of the. It, it, let me just give an example, and not as a suggestion. Yeah. But you could reduce two, but you're very concerned about the K numbers being uncertain, and that we're going to use extra money to build the K slot. Right. If the case lot does not fill, we can undo ESSER and put that money, take it off of school choice within the budget, right? Mm -hmm. So you can give yourself a little, you, you have that extra money that most, you're fortunate because it gives you, it's double-edged because it makes you more decisions, but yeah. it also gives you greater protection within the, the budget. So, uh, so. so. One, one question about the ESSER money. As I understand it, it has to be spent by September of 24, which puts it into yeah. fiscal... No, 24. September 24, which puts it into fiscal 25. You right. you have the potential to spend some funds in fiscal 25 early on. <laughs> um, so I that's what I was trying to piece together. Uh, you know, sort of, if I may, Darius, um, I, I, I would like to say that as I read through Shelley's summary and the options that she was presenting, um, I think that the ability to to use ESSER, we've got a two-year window here to make some changes um, with some funds that won't be available in the future and hopefully help us begin the shift from school choice of uh, some expenses back into the general fund while potentially addressing um, while potentially addressing possible reductions in staff that are necessary. So I I like the phased approach of possibly eliminating two positions for next year and if if necessary a third one the year after but to use ESSER funds elimination of two positions and this is one person talking it's just where I stand um, and uh, approaching it from that angle uh, I don't think you want to go in with five and a quarter percent to a town meeting that's just voted a $12 million library building that people have uh, absorbed pretty hefty tax increases and are facing, you know, more capital expenditures on the horizon. Um, but, you know, it's it's a committee call and I will support whatever the committee decides. Um, I just uh, there are. There are issues outside of the school community that come to come to visit us on town meeting floor. Um, and you know, some of you have seen that. Others, others of us are new enough on the committee that um, may not have experienced it in the past. So, I'd like to see us below five and a quarter percent. I'd like us to consider a phased-in approach on the uh, staffing issue it's not because i want to eliminate staff it's because there are financial realities out there and we've got to find a way to wrestle through them or we're really going to be 
faced a couple of years down the line with major issues. So I would, I would agree with Ken. I, I am not in favor of all three positions in one year. But also, you know, when I look at it, you've already reduced the budget twice, really. You took out the two positions that we were hoping for, came down to seven. Now we've come down to five. And I'm never in favor of cutting our own budget before anybody's even seen it. Like, why would we do that? Except when you look at the enrollment numbers, and the data says we have to do, we have to do a little bit more. So I would agree. I'd agree with Ken. I think one of the wiggle room that you're going to have to look at when talking with the town is how much ESSER money to use. And I also want to make sure people yeah. know who are watching that ESSER money is being spent on other things as well. We're just talking right. about what we, you know, <laughs> and Shelley can use what we're spending the ESSER money on just so I don't want to miss um, the summer. Uh, summer programming, so staffing for summer programming, um, a big chunk for our equity work that we're doing for the audit um, and the equity consultants. Um, Curriculum, we're going to be putting out new curriculum next year, so there's material purchases. We did just get made. another grant on that, by the way. I'm not <laughs> sure that information as soon as it's finalized. And then um, stipends for uh, curriculum development. So I'm just saying, I just want to be really like, oh, you saved all the investor money that was supposed to help, but we are spending on other things as well. I just want to make sure that that's out there as well. Um, but we can, if they, but we're going to meet with the town, and the town, I, I'm sorry, let me just finish one thought. The, the 3.26 is, is also is it is pretty high for what you know right. the town can also be you know yeah. when I say the town the uh select board and finance committee might be asking for us to lower that and then that we may have to massage me <laughs> how much extra money we do to reduce that or not you know that kind of thing and we also have to see where um frontier comes in within its, its assessment as well and how that works with um because I would it's a whole other kind of we're talking about town politics and such. I would say that school choice has saved the town for a two and a half override because it hasn't done one in, in when's the last time town sent a two and a half it override. Right. And, and it, technically you should be doing an override every so often to adjust because you can't, if, if you're gonna have contracts and whatnot that are above two and a half percent, you can't, <laughs> the money's gotta come from somewhere else that how are you taking care of things. And I, I would say that school choice has prevented a two and a half override. Um, mm -hmm. One could argue that. Let's just put it that way. And so, <laughs> so I don't know who wants to argue with me about that. But I just, it's one of those things where I think that two and a half should be happening every ten years because you need to be adjusting your budgets to the proper amount of living. So I think at this point, <laughs> we're at a at a moment where school committee has to decide, like Annie suggested, do we go to public hearing with five point two five percent? Basically, I'll do the whole spiel beginning to end so everybody hears what we've done, the work we've done that Mary mentioned, and we get feedback about the 5.25 and the enrollment changes. And then there's a separate school committee meeting to discuss how to proceed following receipt of that input. Or are you ready to charge us with cut another percent off, cut another percent and a half off before public hearing, and let's present lower than 5.25? And I only want to throw in there, if you're going to reduce staff, you got to say that you go to the public hearing with that. Because you reduce staff, not at the public yeah, hearing, right. and then reduce it later. I mean, I know there's a lot of people watching, so, but yeah. but really, you have to say that this is our intention. <laughs> yeah. to reduce staff. I yeah. think you have to say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a plan. Um, I was, sorry, I was going to, I was just going to, when you were talking about ESSER, I remember in the past, we've talked about the fact that that is, you know, it's a single pot of money, a single, it's not something that will, especially now, I'm surprised it's still around, um, it, that it's not something to rely on for the future. And I guess I'm just, I suppose, uh, wondering, you know, wanting like the one, I mean, you've already said I'm, so I'm not wondering, but like how it will be a good idea to use it and it sounds like just in case you need it yeah like, so we're not we shouldn't be relying on it no and that's why um we haven't put salaries like this on it and we use part of it part of sr1 we did use for salaries in the first year we received to offset 
um, early childhood and school lunch that had significant right. reductions in revenue. Those have bounced back up, so we pulled some of those wages back off. That was the only time, and it wasn't for teaching positions. It was um, our, our early childhood. It, it covered some IAs, but um, we had never intended to use ESSER two or ESSER three to help offset the budget. There are districts that have done that across the state, and they're in really difficult positions. Right. Because they put hundreds of thousands of dollars because they got millions of ESSER. Right. Um, so we've tried to avoid that and use it for other needs, um, COVID and, and not COVID related. Right. And understanding the bigger politics of things, it's some districts are using that as a gap to SOA money, Student Opportunity Act money that is coming to some of those districts. SOA money is not coming to us. Okay, we're not gonna get we're not gonna get much at all. We get chapter seventy funding, we get the thirty, we get the sixty dollars per student. Kind of thing. So there's no SOA money coming our way. So when we talk about a fully funded SOA, they did not help our district at all, or 70% of the state for that matter. Um, or 70% of the districts, that's important because the 20 district does help is the majority of the population, is the right is population <laughs> of the state. Um, and, you know, the millionaire's tax, I was just at a, a conference on this. And so the millionaire's tax is not going to help us either. So mm -hmm. don't be holding your breath that that's going to all of a sudden send waves of cash that's going to offset things. No. By the time they get that through, um, you're going to see very little. So, um, so one other thing with ESSER, Erica, is um, while we've tried not to use it for salaries and wages, we are at a point where we are in a bit of a fiscal pinch, right? And so we have the money there. We can shift our spending efforts, use it while we have it, because if we don't spend it, we lose it. We give it back. Um, if we were not in this position, we would put more PD on it. We would put more curriculum materials. The cost to roll out the new initiatives next year district-wide is significant, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And as Darius said, uh, Laura has been doing a ton of work to write grants to try to get money, knowing that we're having this conversation about ESSER funds, not just at Deerfield, at other districts, about offsetting budget with salaries and wages. So. Um, we're trying to come up with other plans to pay for the curriculum material. So I don't want to give the impression that, you know, this money would get wasted if we didn't need it for this, but we're, we're in a position where we can use it and then find other resources for some of the other things. Um, you know, I don't, we don't know yet what's happening with continuation of the equity work in the new year. I know that their uh, administration's in conversation about that, but we don't have a pot to pay that from without ESSER funds. It's not part of our budget. So, you know, we, we need this ESSER money and we have to strike the balance of budget support and all of those other pieces. And we're lucky we haven't had to do that yet. I feel fortunate that we found a way through the last several years. Well, and that, that's, that's a tribute Shelly, to your foresight and Darius's foresight and managing the ship through these uh, rough waters, uh, the the planning and thought that you, the two of you and the Andy and Tina and the entire administrative team have put into not just, um, well, into the financial management of the district in uh, Deerfield Elementary School so that we're not faced yet with having hard discussions about cuts in services, among other things. So uh, I, I can't thank you enough uh, for your, you know, thank the team enough for their, for their efforts in that respect. So. <clears throat> I have a question about something Mary said about like a phased approach. <laughs> to you know not losing all three positions at the same time but like really thinking about if it was a phased approach like what would make the most sense in terms of what you know and that's a hard question because you're sort of so but like I, in terms of the needs right so i don't think that we'd make that decision here and now we would you would say we would like you to develop a phased approach we would go back and I would give Tina time to also yeah. have conversations and that kind right. of stuff. And, yeah. Okay, these are the things that moving pieces we're playing with. Let's let's kind of work this out. And then we would bring that back. So I would say I would say you would ask us to <clears throat> we summarize what I'm hearing. We'd like to see a phased approach and we'd like the percentage of the budget to be at 
blank, you know, 3.25, okay? We will go back, create a phrased approach, and show you, we'll tell you how we can get to different options of getting to that, and that would be the budget hearing. Yeah. And then so we, we would present the 3.25 yeah. at a budget hearing. This is the phase approach. You can then adjust it at that point and say, we don't like right. your phase approach. You can do the same thing, but that would be, at least give us a snapshot in time yeah. for the discussion. <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I also, I know we keep talking about town meeting. It's, I would not say it's representative of the entire town, and I know that's who ends up making decisions about the final budget and stuff, but um, I do think it has been an exceptional time in education the last three years, so I don't think it's unreasonable to be higher than 2.5% given all that has occurred, and I, I believe that the community wants the best for our children as we sort of come out of this. Um, so I, I really like Mary's idea of a, like a phased approach, knowing that we're going to probably be, I'm comfortable with being a little higher in percent and maybe that's because I'm newer, but I also know that it has been such an exceptional three years. And I think it's reasonable to make decisions that are still in the best interest of the social, emotional well-being and academic well-being of kids. And if that means, you know, not cutting three positions right away and really taking a phased approach and getting the lay of the land about what it's like to educate post pandemic. I think that's reasonable. And maybe I um, am an optimist, but I feel like a lot of our community members would understand that and want the same for the kids in our school too. Right. So I agree. And the process that happens after our, our public meeting is the town's going to, I say this again, the select the, Finance Community Select Board are going to say how much money the town has. Yeah. So they have whatever their revenues are this year. And we don't, that's the part where we're kind of in a vacuum where we don't have that number. Yeah. And they don't have that number. I don't think they don't have that number yet either, right? In no. Of year, right? And so they're going to say our growth is $400,000. Okay. You want to take between us and Frontier, you're going to want to take $250,000. You know, the, you know, the rest of the town budget doesn't fit there. So that's that's the game that, yeah. that happens next. And just kind of so yeah. people can understand, some years it fits fine. They're like, we can make that without a problem. And you know, we're gonna use this and they're gonna shift things around. Right and then, or then you sometimes you have to go to the town. Sometimes, as you said, the town people, <coughs> I think they're gonna back this if that's what you're, you're hearing out there. Or if that's part of our messaging right. at the school committee is to right. do community outreach around that. Yep. And you can so, but the problem is the money is the money. And if you don't, if you go above that, then they have to do it two and a half, weeks. and then that goes to a ballot. So you can do it on town meeting floor, and then have to do it about. Just kind of know yeah. how how it kind of plays out further down the road. Yeah. So you better. So if you get to that point, we you know, and I'm just kind of letting people know what the different stages yeah. are because it's yeah. it's like how does the what happens if you say you want a higher number and you think the towns are behind it, you know, and we just to validate. It's very different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, reducing by two positions will save us almost 2%. So we would be going into public hearing around 3.25, if that's the direction the committee wants to go in. The third position uh, we would maintain, but as Ken said, to help offset school choice and start to bring down those expenses, we would use ESSER funds to cover some school choice costs for a year so that we can start to build our reserves back up <laughs> and, and tackle that. And what would cutting one position? Uh, it would be about 1%. It would only be 1%, yeah. so it would only bring it down to 4.25. Right. Yeah. As Shelly says, think of it in terms of $51,000 as a percent. And so, <clears throat> Oh, I know. I had a question before and I forgot it, and now I remember. It was about um, the, I guess, I guess it's the next item on the thing, which is about the school choice question, and how I, in a way, it feels like we're trying, as you said, we're 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 not flying blind, but just that there's there are variables out there that we don't know yet, and so we're having to act on it ahead of ahead of them. And so I guess that's one of the things. It's like how is how is the school choice question going to affect 
of this? Well, well we have to vote on being a school choice school. Technically, yeah. that's the vote, right? Yeah. And then there could be additional discussion about number of students right. down the road. So we can go into that because it is part of the discussion of because I didn't know where we we're going to land. I have two charts. One is school choice if everything remains the same, and one is what I would recommend for school choice if, if the highlighted ones are if those were the classrooms that were. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I don't. It's a little tricky, particularly when it comes to kindergarten, because if we're not going to, our number is at that point of right. two, or do we have three? <laughs> and so sometimes we hold on to the position and we see what the enrollment looks like and then decide to add school choice. That's happened before. Sometimes we just go in with two. I don't know where we're landing. So so the, you would vote to make it be a school choice school. So, okay. you know, and then from there, team would basically be in a frozen <laughs> patch for any, any grades that are in play. She's not going to add any school choice to the, to the grades that we're discussing. <laughs> but if she gets a... Um, a third grader next year third grader you know you know that's the 14 and 15 class certainly we could accept that yeah. and get those families situated to come. Mm -hmm. but right now i would say the rest of the lineup is probably frozen and do we have yeah do you have school choice siblings any incoming kindergarten yeah. siblings i didn't look into that i just looked at the number that we had so that right. was a good question um but again, so if we do plus and minus for every single grade. And the reason why we do, well, uh, no equal greater than to equal to or greater than one, uh, <laughs> because what that allows us to do, if you close a grade level and a student moves out of district in the middle of the year, we allow them to stay school choice. So that it's not disruptive to the child. If you didn't do that, that child would have to leave. Mm -hmm. So that's it's really a safeguard. That's why it says equal to plus one in all of them, because we had that happen. Um, so we fix that. The three pending applications in the incoming fifth grade. It's a damper on making it look like that was a fairly easy numbers wise change to make. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean by that, Carrie? Well, that? Um, if we're at 40 students currently in fifth grade, uh, incoming fifth grade, mm -hmm. and thinking like you do two sections of 20. Right. That, like, you know, it's like numbers wise, that would make sense. But if you're looking at three incoming, right, that's why it would take any school choice, they would close that. Right. Yeah. So it would be it. Yep. <clears throat> Which that's a scenario where it makes sense to not take school choice because it will cost us more to right. run the third right. section right. than the fifteen thousand we're bringing in. Right. As the sections stand currently, we're not in that position. It's not costing us any more because our resident students are helping right. make up the composition of the class. And. How, as of now, pending applications, how much more of that increase as we get a full year? Not much. This is about the heavy time that we get our applications in. Most school districts make decisions around April, so maybe we'll get some up until then, but not much. So if, let, let's see, think about this phased approach. So somehow keeping a kindergarten teacher, for example, then would we consider something different in terms of those six pending applications? That's a question for, yes. If so that would be part three. of what you guys would be considering as we send you back with that chart. And the decision on what classroom reduces might not even change in alignment with the budget like we can make a decision to reduce the budget to x which means we're reducing sections and reducing staffing but what grade level actually reduces might have to wait until kindergarten enrollment is finalized mm -hmm. right so 
we know what we have to do, but we can make a decision down the road. Obviously, we want to give any staff that are impacted by it enough time to do what they need to do on their end to find other employment if we're talking about letting a person go. Ideally, you know, if we could have it happen where there's no bodies impacted, we do have a couple people on LOA that they have till May 15th on their on leave of absences to let us know if they're coming back. If they didn't come back, then you're not talking about actually letting someone go or a resignation right. that we don't know about yet. Yeah, I guess I just I do feel like we don't want to um, we don't want to make whatever decisions are decided a hardship on you know uh, minimize the hardship on anyone who's affected by this. Like we don't want to waffle on this and keep people in limbo and then like, whatever. But but at the same time, like, if the, if it makes sense to do a phase, you know, to be able to to get some more you know the feedback from from um, you know the, the the town to do the hearing to get some some of that and um, be able to know that um, you know, we we're all I mean I, you know that that there is that um, feeling of sorry my brain just blipped <laughs> but um, I uh, yeah sorry. I also to let you know that school so I would recommend that you vote the change that Tina's you know vote to be a school choice school with the recommendation of placement for Tina to freeze the classes in, in <laughs> freeze classes until we have more information. So I would suggest you vote that tonight. Also note that we move the vote up. Usually, so you're saying about you know time with families, we usually don't vote school choice until April. Um, we've asked to move it up because we've noticed that a lot of other schools are letting people know earlier. So we're trying to get that. But if families have to wait, they're going to have to wait. And so what they, you know, the thing about school choice is you could say you're going somewhere and then withdraw and go somewhere else. So mm -hmm. they can they can hedge their. It's not like, um, you know, it's not like colleges where you can choose one. You can't just be you, you can actually play. And families that have does. played that game. Um, so that does happen. Even though we have six pending applications, we may only get three. So right. last year we actually accepted 12 and had to dump with none. So right. So this just allows us to we're doing all the districts um earlier just so that you know people can lock people in earlier. Um, but if the reality is, you know, if they're going and looking at let's say the fifth grade, and that's just the reality, and we have to have a conversation that it doesn't look like it's gonna happen this year and let that families know that, but we'll let you know if it changes. I would be open to you guys coming up with a phased approach that includes using ASSER funds because that seems like it could be a really helpful way and a tool for us to be flexible with how this happens um, at 3.25%. That's what I would propose. And then I'm very much looking forward to hearing from the community at the public hearing before a final vote, because I, for me personally, that's like a big piece of the puzzle that's missing. Um, so can I clarify just to make sure that I understand what, <laughs> um, and the whole committee, I guess, would have to agree on it anyway, but when you say a phased approach in using ESSER funds, are you saying using ESSER funds to offset the budget and keeping classes as they are, or are you saying reducing class sizes and staffing? A combination of both, I think, okay. because of a, not cutting all three at once, but as Mary had suggested, a phased approach based on a discussion that you all sort of maybe have, but also not hanging on to the ESSER funds, because I think this is the exact kind of time where you would use them to, to sort of have a flexible approach to keeping services as level as possible in a post-pandemic time like that makes a lot of sense to me but i also recognize we're in a huge budget crunch and a combination of both of those things might be a good option um, um, as, yeah as i understand it this is level services funded right now correct 
Yes. And even with the changes we're discussing, your your services are still level funded. It's Correct. it's it's a it's more staffing related <laughs> than service related. So the I, I think it's important to note that and and let people know that we're not talking about reducing the services that the Deerfield Elementary School provides. We're talking about student teacher ratios. Um, and you know, it's a it's a great <laughs> I just, you know, I don't want you to think in that what's being talked about here is a reduction in services. We're not talking about cutting music. We're not talking about PE. We're not talking about any of the extra programs that are in the school presently or any of the programs that are in the school being cut. We're talking about wrestling with enrollment decline and how to properly staff for the future. <laughs> so... And closing out school choice. I mean, that's huge. And I think right. that that's that to me is the biggest impact um, that we're going to that's that's huge. Yeah. Um, but I think a phased approach makes sense and it gives time to figure out like maybe through attrition or other means where that might happen with the least impact to staff as well. I guess I wouldn't mind throwing that question or just getting feedback, does a phased approach, does that, um, I know you've come with the proposal of, you know, recommending the, pro the proposal for the, for those, um, a specific proposal, but it does, does doing a phased approach, how does that sit for, for you? Does that just make things really doable? Does it seem mm -hmm. to be and I think we came, we came up with a phased approach. We said two or three, right? So, mm -hmm. okay. so okay. yeah. all right, because yeah, I mean, we have our thoughts, but yeah. as as everyone's saying, and I want to acknowledge that too, you've done a whole lot of work to get this to this point. So we don't want to just derail what you're trying to do. Um, would love to have some of that flexibility if there is any. Yeah, the phased approach just prolongs the process of how many years we have to continue to have conversations like this. You know, we could take the could take the rip the band-aid off, let's do it all in one year, and then we have to tackle, we still have the school choice issue, we still have the pre-K revolving issue, but general fund is taken care of all at once. So, you know, how do we want to manage that? Because it's not a one year conversation. Right. And shall we, would the ESSER funds be what you proposed, or you'll take a look at that again? Um, you talked about where the IA wage increase of 52000 and then 101 for transportation. Yeah, I think we would look, look at, at it again. again. I, I think if we were if we were talking about school committee was okay consolidating two grade levels, so eliminating two positions, we would look at okay. offsetting that third position with ESSER funds. Okay. Um, and sort of taking that um, what's written on there off the table. Awesome. So it would be about um, could be around eighty five thousand or so. Um, and basically, we would be offsetting school choice <coughs> to bring our choice expenses down. Right. But in theory, between now and a year when we have to go when we're going through this process again, that's like a whole other year of information and data about like how kids are doing, how this all worked out and maybe through attrition that the, that position doesn't necessarily work, doesn't work out or isn't filled anyway. So I feel like that feels like a better bet to gather data for us or for me at least. Mm -hmm. Sure. Another year's worth of information about what younger increment classes. <laughs> right. It, it right. has been a downward trend but there's so many points that continues or yeah. work out. Um, I would also, I would like to be lower than 5.25%. What would be comfortable with a three and a quarter inch proposal? So the next time school committee sees the budget will be at public hearing with a goal of 3.25-ish percent. Just want to make sure I have that clear. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? 
Just thank you all for such yeah, hard thank work. Thank you. A lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. So you do have the whole, yeah. we talked about the uh, school choice. Yes, yeah. So yeah. We just need yeah. Okay, so just give a motion and second on that. Yeah. I, I, I liked your motion language, Darius. Could you read it again? <laughs> oh, I didn't, um, didn't write it down. <laughs> um, you know, to basically approve school to be a school choice school um, and following the freezing enrollment or freezing uh, acceptance. Right now, right? Freezing acceptance in grades that are yeah. um, under consideration for you know, combination of classes. Or, yeah, not combination. Gotcha. Just remain a school choice school and freeze. Um, I'm getting tired. <laughs> For those grade level under consideration. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody like to make that motion? I would make the motion to um, participate in school choice for the fiscal 2024 school year as recommended by administration. Second. All right. I'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Mary? Yes. Anna? Yes. Terry? Yes. Erica? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, next up on the agenda, we have um, goal setting for the committee, which can be rolled together with the energy committee discussion. Sure. I would uh, just like to point out that approach it to our mark yeah so perhaps yeah. a brief conversation <laughs> um anyone have any further thoughts on the goal setting aspect of it i mean only only in the you know uh, very briefly just to say that like the idea of um you know if we are able to you know have this phase part of part of what we were talking about being able to gather more data um and to be able to have a um you know use some of that uh the time in the next year to be able to clarify some of some of the overarching goals for the committee of in terms of what our um you know mission or you know what our sites are for how we want to um, be most effective in aiding the administration um towards uh you know their effective governance is really it. I just um, in general wanted to be able to spend time this year, you know, kind of discussing that. Like I said, we, we've been here for two hours and we, 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 we don't need to do that now, but um, but uh, I think that this conversation we should just be continuing. And then, you know, as we, as the audit comes in and then we get information there and, and looking at enrollment, status and trends and things like that so maybe we can do some uh some of that analysis talking about the energy you know and, and things just so we get a sort of global overarching picture of um of, of what uh of the the, the how everything how everything including the budget plays into yeah. you know what we're trying to accomplish as a community really what I'm trying to get across. So continue keeping this as an agenda item. Continue yeah, conversation. I think so. And as it comes up and yeah, when we have more time, you know, when we're not pressed for time and, <laughs> and we're a little more pressed for brain cells, <laughs> we, can, yeah. we can look at it further. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I think just, so I met with the Energy Committee, two members of the Energy Committee about two weeks ago. Um, and I think this, fits into the sort of like what is the larger goal and like how do we interact with other entities within the community to best support the school but also like advocate for the things that we need and just like get messaging out because I feel like there's so many different things going on in different parts of town government 
but not always like talking to each other until we like all of a sudden we're in a public hearing or like someone's talking at town meeting. Um, so in terms of energy committee, they're very interested in supporting our efforts, especially with some repairs and replacements coming up for the A H, not the HV, no, the HVAC, the AC unit in the school. Um, and so they they have some resources and grants and you know they do a lot of work and it could be really good for us to collaborate with them as we look ahead and darius had mentioned possibly having like a subcommittee about capital improvements in which case that to me it seems like a perfect opportunity to invite people like the energy committee maybe a facilities person to sort of like bring them the most concise information to this kind of a meeting with all the background information so it doesn't feel disjointed and i don't i'm not saying that that's how it's been presented now but it just feels a little more like a community collaboration so i think that fits into some of those like how do we operate on like a higher <laughs> level and interact with other community entities um but long story short is they want to help us so when we talk yeah. about it next they will you know we can sort of invite them in thank you thanks for doing that yeah any further discussion okay we can move on to reports uh no report from the chair is there a collaborative report not nothing major from the collaborative they just they're really making big moves on some of their capital projects right. they're they just invested about six hundred fifty thousand dollars into their main building, and they're they're gearing up the next fiscal year to do a three point five million dollar update to their Heck Academy building, which is grotesquely in need of some updates. So I think, obviously, as a participating member, that's a big chunk of change, and I feel like it's important to be aware of. Uh, so that's just in the infancy stages, though. But those were the like kind of main pieces to take away from the last meeting. Thank you. Okay. Superintendent's report. Um, the uh, CMSI equity audit is coming um, the 20th, 21st and 22nd of March. And I believe you guys though received an email from um, Jen yeah. signing up if you want to do an interview. Um, on one of those days, and there will also be serious support coming in the next few weeks, um, early March. So, so kind of rolling, it's going to kind of, right now they're already collecting data from us and so on and so forth. I think I talked a little bit about that last time, but that's the latest part of where, um, if you can't make the time frame on Jan, you can also go to the public hearing. The public, um, will be an open time where they meet with you know, parents and such, and be, Show up as a parent if you want, or they don't. They don't care. They don't really care when they, we're organizing different things to get different people. But if you know your schedule doesn't work, just contact me. And, um, we can put you in different spots. That I just want to make sure if you want to meet with them, they get to. Um, the superintendency agreement committee. Um, we have a draft. It is with the attorney um, right now, and I actually talked to him today about it. The the problem with the draft is we still don't have a unit 38 agreement and so when i show it to the attorney he's like yes this can work and he's working on making it so it can work and can um if he was on that group as you know we, we really thought a lot of different wording and how how to govern basically five committees govern a superintendent is where we don't we just have past practice um and some of the past practice has been based on a union agreement it's because it, there's some of the stuff that you guys were doing follows what a union agreement would do but um, we don't have a copy of that. And so um, the idea of going back and creating a union agreement can get very dicey and very political because um, of what it says and how the power structure worked within that. So he's going to try to go the route that we're going, Ken. Um, yeah. He did have a meeting with Desi um, as well because the Department of Education wants to know how we're setting things up. They don't particularly care about union agreements. Um, they care about regional agreements and they'd rather see us regionalize, um, but we just all know that's not probably um, realistic. So I continue to want to make sure that we at least get a governance policy procedure in place that the committee will follow so that if um, you ever have to 
take action on a superintendent in the sense of even hiring one, um, any of that kind of thing there is, it's clear in how those decisions are made. Because right now, if you were to hire, I think we talked about this a hundred times, but if you try to hire a superintendent, Deerfield wanted somebody, Sunderland wanted somebody else, there's no language about how you come to common terms about hiring a superintendent if there's disagreement. Um, same thing as if I got in trouble in one district, would you sit at the table of the discipline hearing if I did something in Central? You know, there's no comment, there's no comment, there's no conversation about how that works. Mm -hmm. And without that, I think it puts you guys in a spot of um, legally, it would be a kind of a mess. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, so this, the, what we put together does answer some of those things, but doesn't go back to, um, at some point, we're going to have to come back around and look at a union agreement again. Right. <laughs> so at least we get a, a stopgap in place so that at least it can function uh, on paper a little bit. Um, superintendent evaluation, um, while we were meeting regarding that, Ken and Bob said, hey, can we move up the superintendent evaluation earlier so that we do it at the joint meeting? Um, I started putting that together. I went to Sunderland's meeting on Tuesday. and. Um, Jessica's like, um, you don't have to do it after year three. You can do it every other year. And I was like, well, if I don't have to do it this year. I can do it every other year. But Ken said um, he is going to want to run that by the committees to see if they agree with doing that. Right, Ken? That That's correct. Asking? Yeah, that was my suggestion today was that we at least <laughs> ask other members of this committee. And if you could ask your other committees, I mean, just to make sure that we're all in agreement. I. I think that um, if we don't have to do an evaluation, it gives the newer um, newer members of our school committees, and I think we have a fair number of them this year, don't we, um, that a, a chance to get a full year under their belt with, and be able to participate in the evaluation process, you know, more more knowledgeably, I guess is the way I'd put it. Right. Um, so the basically what it's saying is that teachers after their third year get professional status are on an every other evaluation cycle and so the saying administrators are, just, are in the same boat or superintendents are in the same boat right so right. i'm in my i'm in my fourth official year my fifth year at service but i was an intern for a year so um so it, it does become the question of whether or not we evaluate or not so and the only other piece was that if if he did not have a contract that was salary specific through the five years of the contract, would the committees want to be considering salary changes without an evaluation? But since we don't have that issue, he, uh, his salary is set for next year. <clears throat> I don't see as neat, as burning a need for an evaluation given his proficient almost um it borderline exemplar performance evaluation last year so so ken how do you want to so again we don't have an opera we don't have an operation about <laughs> we don't have an operational because <laughs> it, it's i can't this is just but, where it gets so but, but, you know i would just what does this committee think do you want to evaluate darius this year or do you mind waiting a year that's the question. But then can we, 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 even before you go into that, can we run into the problem of what if you don't want to evaluate, but Conway does? Oh, I know. And so <laughs> if part of you just kind of wants to say, like, let the chairs okay. talk to the committee members, and they should all talk to each other, and then let me know. There you I go, know Carrie. Any one district wanted it. But then <laughs> It's, it's not the end of the world either. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll put the thing together. But, but shouldn't um, we have a? I mean, shouldn't we have a procedure? Because maybe we don't want to do it this year because it's you, and we, and you had such a good evaluation last year. I think it's, right. you know, yeah. But what about in the future? Does it? Does do we need to have something that's right? And you haven't had this problem because you last used to convince to make the airport. <laughs> The, uh, yeah, I mean, it, okay. it's well, basically well, it's a retirement. So I thought you say it'd be that way, but uh, it's basically the the language is such, Mary, that it says that if he has achieved a rating of proficient or exemplar, you don't need to do a, an evaluation in the following year. If it's needs improvement or 
you know, less than proficient, then you need to continue. And I think it's the needs improvement was something like a very short time frame on on the, the new evaluation. So um, it, it it's just it's a one year hiatus, and we're back. Evaluate the following year. If it's again proficient or you know proficient plus or even even higher, then again you you would go a, a full year without having to evaluate. You can also talk with next year's a contract year, so right next year's the contract year. So <laughs> I think it makes sense to like mirror the teacher, like if there's already sort of like a schedule in place that teachers follow, then that as the leader of the district that makes sense to me too. We would follow that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mary, to your point, I think it's, we are it be, it's setting precedent with this that could or could not be called in the future, but we are kind of but the language. The language is there when I hear Ken explain it. Yeah. I mean, super. The, the thing about super, the one thing about it is it gives you feedback, but the other side of it, there's not many superintendents that are evaluated out. The committee just simply doesn't either renew their contract mm -hmm. or negotiates for them to leave. That's not a working situation. So if there's a part of me that gets frustrated with the evaluation process because that's not really, as, wow. you know, another school committee member said, we'll let you know when you're not doing your job. Well, that's you know what I mean? Like, thing, like, you know, there's some truth to that. Like, it's more than every other year. Though. Right. Yeah, that's true. And, and and Darius, I would I, I would just read this to the committee so that they they know I, I asked the question. Within his contract under evaluation, it says the superintendent will be evaluated by the committees on an annual basis as mutually agreed by the parties in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 71, Section 38, comma, Department of Elementary and Secondary Regulations, comma, and the superintendent evaluation system as prescribed by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the, um, the evaluation system as prescribed is what Jessica was referring to in their conversation the other night. Um, and uh, it, to me, it makes sense. <clears throat> Okay, so we, should we need to take a vote on this or are we just no this was just a general i just wanted to get a I, I just wanted you to have a general feel of where the committee's at and <laughs> i was approached because i'm the chairman of the joint committee um and bob hollow was is the frontier chair so he and i have typically talked with darius on evaluation procedures and things and that's that's how it came up um so I think we can take a one year hiatus and uh, make sure that by January of next year, we're ready to evaluate them in a contract year. <clears throat> we'll be getting a letter from me wishing to negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm okay, skipping this year with consistent reviews from the past couple of years. Yes. yes. Great. Thank you. Is there anything else? Okay. All righty. Bring this to the end of the agenda. Unless anyone desperately needs to add something at 814. <laughs> I would take a motion to adjourn. Is there an is there an opportunity for um, public input, <laughs> or just really a couple questions I have? Uh, I'm, uh, officially, no. Okay. Because public comment already passed. Um, and there's an opportunity. It's, an, it's regarding the budget, I assume. Um, yeah. Can I? Can I just? Yeah. So, how about I'll ask my my questions, and if that's not apropos, then I'll just ask them when I can. But I'm curious about why the um, SOA funds did not help our district and why the fair share um, funds are said not to be able to help our district. So SOA is is proportioned out by our basically right now we are um, we are in a held in a it's called a hold, uh, hold harmless state. Being that we don't get any more money because of our declining enrollment, 
and the makeup of um, the wealth of our towns. So we're considered to be, we're in the middle range and the, the, the spectrum of wealth and majority of SOA money is going to the larger urban districts um, where they're getting, um, I think it's like 20 schools that are getting the majority of the SOA money. Okay, so, and how about the fair share? Fair share is going to be, so I met um, at the, the superintendent's meeting um, round table for Pioneer Valley. We had the Taxpayer Association of Massachusetts came in gave a presentation that was asked about, can we see money coming from that? He said, I would not expect it. One, we won't see it in the following year because they have no idea how much money they're actually gonna collect. Um, it gets really technical when you get into how um, tax finance works. But the other side is going to be divided up between higher education and, um, and, and K-12. K it's also gonna be divided up between roads and whatever. And that's all gotta be appropriated. Mm -hmm. The majority of appropriation of those kinds of monies are going to where the SOA money is going. And they could actually take that money and put it into the SOA. They don't have to create a different account with it. So mm -hmm. it's all, so he said, I would not be, you're not going to see a windfall of money coming from that. Mm -hmm. um, he also said, because he's not, they're a nonpartisan group. He's also saying it's also going to be interesting if there's going to be an exodus of wealthy people who will move to their second homes to avoid the taxation because it's the largest taxation in over 50 years change. So he's being, he's just, this person presented just very matter of factly about it. Mm -hmm. And so we're, yeah. So that's that, 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 last, that last point has been discussed ad nauseum and that's not really what the research is showing, but, um, and I'll keep this really brief, I promise. Um, I just think that, cause I'm trying to keep it very practical for the next meeting that you guys are gonna be presenting at the public hearing. And I'm uh, to not mince words, like I'm horrified by what I'm finding out in this meeting tonight. And I think that a lot of um, taxpayers and parents who have been um, were lobbied about the fair share amendment um, are going to feel like, wow, what did we what did we just vote for? I thought we were going to get something out of that. So I understand that our beef with that doesn't lie with with the school committee, that this is a state level thing. But I think it should be um, prepared for that there might be that kind of, if anybody's paying attention, there will and should be that kind of pushback. Um, if they're not, then no worries. But, and I consider like my personal role um, to make that known, to channel that anger, disappointment, disillusionment to the appropriate places in the state. But I think that the school committee and the district could help support that narrative keep educating people that that's how that process is working and that you're right. We should get some of that money or some of that money or some of that money. Like there's, there's money out there. So we have to advocate for that so that it's appropriated to us. But I just think be prepared. If I went to the public hearing without, without having been here tonight, I would have been like, what are you talking about? We just voted for all this money for schools and you're talking about eliminating positions. I'm horrified. And I understand all the work that went into it and that I'm preaching to the choir. But yeah, I'll tell you, in regards to that, where you could, <coughs> you should talk to your state legislators because yes. there is no process yet. Would they, the bill is very vague um, on, on the, um, the, um, on the and, and that money. And they don't, there's no indication of how they're going yes. to appropriate those funds and in which, who's going to get what percentage. Right. And because that hasn't been figured out, that's why they're saying there's going to be a long delay before we see any of that money. Will we ever see some money? It's possible. But mm -hmm. right now, it's like you're not getting any next year or even the year yeah, after. So I oh, personally yeah. made that clear to people that I canvassed and, and lobbied for the fair share. Your job, Our job is not done after this. We have to advocate right. for the allocation of that those funds. So I get that. But <laughs> when, you, when you guys present at a public hearing and people are hearing this, you know, that has to that narrative should be clear that because otherwise the beef is going to come down on school committee and our, our towns. And look, we just voted to raise taxes and we don't get anything out of it. So then the next time we ask for a tax raise, that's going to be an argument. So I just ask that the committee kind of support the narrative that, um, you know, we're doing the best we can, but the beef lies with not even the beef. We have to contact the state. This is really more of a state issue. And for all this, like kicking the can down, you, you know, these past couple of years and patching it all together. Well, now we're at the precipice of all that. And now we're starting to feel what other districts have felt for a long time. 
because of school choice. We we got an influx, so we got the influx of money that came with those students. But other districts have been losing revenue at those right. students. And now we're starting to see that too. And so it really all comes back to the whole school choice thing working as it's supposed to. And that's ultimately having school committees have to make these kinds of choices, breaking down public education. That's the part I won't belabor up tonight because it's late and you're tired and preaching to the choir. But um, just to prepare for those meetings, um, we I think we I would love to see you, us, whatever, get a head start on that narrative that it's time you're mad about that. Here's our representatives' numbers, and we know exactly who they are and exactly what their numbers are, and they're generally supportive of public education oh. and can go to Boston then and say, "Hey, this is what I'm hearing from my constituents, and something needs to change." So that's thanks so Thank much you. for those last two questions and and taking my input. I didn't realize about the whole public speaking thing. Believe it or not, I'm still trying to get used to all the changes. So <laughs> I appreciate it. And thank you all. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Wow. We did a motion to uh, We did a motion and then no, we seconded. Okay. We did. Then we did. okay, then we didn't vote. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yes. So, yeah. Erica? Oh, Erica yes. Vote. yes. Uh, Carrie, yes. Any yes? yes. Oh, sorry, I'm speaking yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> Mary? Yes. Ken? Yes. Already. Turned at eight.